things be fulfilled. And so uh, we trust the Bible 100% to always give us the truth. You can, uh, you can read books and get some truth, and you may get a mixture, and some of it might not be truth. And you can listen to some speakers and, and get some truth, but maybe not all of it will be the truth. But when we look into the blessed Word of God, we see 100% pure truth. And that's what we need. And the 16th Psalm, I want to preach on the subject this morning, satisfaction without perfection. Satisfaction without perfection. Verse number 1, Preserve me, O God, for in Thee do I put my trust. O my soul, Thou hast said unto the Lord, Thou art my Lord, my goodness extendeth not to Thee. But to the saints that are in the earth, and to the excellent in whom is all my delight, their sorrows shall be multiplied that hasten after another God. Their drink offerings of blood will I not offer, nor take up their names into my lips. The Lord is the portion of mine inheritance and of my cup. Thou maintainest my lot. The lines are fallen unto me in pleasant places. Yea, I have a goodly heritage. I will bless the Lord who hath given me counsel. My reins also instruct me in the night seasons. I have set the Lord always before me. Boy, I wish you would underline that. That phrase. I have set the Lord always before me. Because he is at my right hand, I shall not be moved. Therefore, my heart is glad. Underline that word glad. I want you to connect up today. <laughs> I want you to connect up with gladness. I want you to be glad that you're saved. Be glad that you belong to God. Be glad whether things are good or things are bad. But you can be glad. He says, therefore, my heart is glad. And my glory rejoiceth. Underline that word. My glory rejoiceth. My flesh also shall rest in hope. And underline the word hope. For thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. Thou wilt show me the path of life. In thy presence is fullness of joy. Underline that phrase, fullness of joy. At thy right hand there are, next word is what? Pleasures forevermore. Underline the word pleasures. I want to speak today on having in your life satisfaction without perfection. Nobody has perfection in their life. Not in this life. And yet God gives us the prescription to have joy and a blessed life without having to demand that everything goes our way. Without de demanding that every day is the day that we would design. That having whatever comes our way, regardless of what emotions might try to intrude into our lives, we can have pleasure and joy and satisfaction without perfection. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, I pray that you would bless to the end that we might know thee in a very close and intimate way. Lord, that we might be able to say, the Lord is my portion. The Lord is always at my right hand. I have set the Lord before me. And so therefore, Lord, we can rejoice. Lord, give us that portion today. I pray for the ones under the sound of my voice at this time who are undergoing harsh, terrible trials in their lives. And Lord, let them know that there is a pleasure and a satisfaction, a delight that can be theirs without demanding perfection in those circumstances. May the sweet Holy Spirit come and encourage our hearts this morning, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Satisfaction without perfection. David's life David wrote this psalm, and David's life was always in danger. When in these days, the psalmist, David, is on the run. He has been anointed to be the next king of Israel. He has been told that he will occupy that throne and he will rule the nation. But King Saul, at the present, is a very bitter, he's a very paranoid, 
He's a very jealous and envious person. And he makes David his target. And so David is on the run. He's through the deserts. He's through the rocks. He's through the forest. He's, uh, he's hiding out just to preserve his life. And he's being hunted like a dog. And yet, in this psalm, he talks about having pleasure evermore. And uh, Psalm 16 was probably written during one of his most awful periods when he was running from King Saul. It's called a mictum psalm. If you, if you uh, have those, that inscription right at the top before verse 1, uh, it says a mictum of David. There's actually six of them. A mictum means something that is a, like a golden engraving. Are you with me? A golden engraving. So the other five psalms that are mictums are in Psalms 56 through 60. This one's kind of isolated by itself. And so it's a golden, it's, it's, it's figurative language for being an, an, an engraved golden meditation. Are you with me? An engraved golden meditation. How many of you think gold is pretty precious? <laughs> yeah, and if you, in, if you have something gold that's engraved upon, then it's permanent. And, and so the thought here is that David has this meditation uh, of this particular period of time when he's being hunted, and yet he enjoys the, the delight of the Lord in the midst of the worst of circumstances. And his meditation is such that it is called a mictum, that it ought to be engraved for every generation to follow. It ought to be engraved upon our hearts that when we go through times like that, that we ourselves can remember back that David on the run said that in my circumstances I can still have joy. And you can too. It's a golden psalm. And uh, no study of the psalm could be, uh, of this psalm, could be complete without the recognition that verse number 10, look at it, it says, Thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. Notice holy one is capitalized, and this is none other than the Lord Jesus Christ in its application here. But it also applies to David. And we're going to look at this psalm, however, in the light of what it meant to David and what it ought to mean to us. David was a king. Look here. David was a king already. God has anointed him. Remember when Samuel poured the oil upon his head and anointed him king, and he said, you're going to sit upon the throne? He's a king in God's eyes already, but he's not physically sitting on that throne yet, and his life is like a life on the run. He's dodging bullets, so to speak. He's dodging the javelins and the spears and the arrows of King Saul and his men. David is on the run. He's fleeing like a bird from the hunter. Many Christians would say, you know, my, my life's a lot like David's. <laughs> it seems like I'm always dodging bullets. Seems like everything is always happening to me. Seems like there's always heartaches and trials and hardships that come my way. Why can't life just be good all the time? <laughs> Don't you wish it was? Well, it can be. Now, it might be that you riding life like a roller coaster, but you don't have to fear, and you don't have to be discouraged. Many people are living more mad than they are glad. Somebody said, I'm a Christian, but I'm not mad about it. <laughs> Isn't that the way we ought to be? <laughs> I want to be saved, but not mad about it. And I'm a Christian, and I've got more than meets the eye to my life. And uh, I remember the story that, that old Zig Ziglar, the motivational speaker, told about back years ago. I was re required for a job in sales many decades ago to read uh, a, a book by Zig Ziglar called See You at the Top. And Zig was a motiv motivator. He's always trying to make people see the potential instead of the problems. And he told the story about... Mr. B, the big shot, who owned a big corporation, and he's at the restaurant early one morning visiting with his buddies and having breakfast, and, and they're gabbing, and first thing you know, he looks down at his watch, and man, he is late. 
And so he throws down his money on the table, jumps uh, up out of the chair and runs out the door, gets in his sports car, revs up the motor, slams it in reverse, burns rubber as he's backing out of his parking place, and away he goes, man. He puts the metal, he puts the pedal to the fiberglass. And uh, he's going down the road, and he's rushing to get to his office, and uh, he looks up in the mirror, and oh no, <laughs> he sees the flashing lights. So he pulls over, and the policeman comes up to the window, and uh, the executive rolls down his window. He's already getting mad as an old wet hen. He's late already, and he looks up at the officer, and he says, what, shouldn't you be out chasing criminals instead of bothering somebody like me? And the officer said, I'm doing my job, sir. I'll have your uh, driver's license and your registration and uh, your proof of insurance, please. And uh, the man said, look, I know I was in a hurry, but I'm an important man. I've got business to do. And the officer said, I'll need to see your papers, please. And so the man gives him his papers, crams them out there into the police officer's hand, and he's stewing, and he's getting madder by the minute. And uh, he uh, was handed a ticket by the officer. Officer hands his papers back to him. He snatches them out of his hand and he drives on down to the office and he gets out and he stomps into the office and first guy he sees is his sales manager and he said, uh, sales manager said, good morning Mr. B. He said, what's good about it? He said, I want to see you in my office right now. <laughs> and he tells the sales manager, come on in. And he says, I want to know why our sales are not up like they ought to be. I talked to you about this. We got to get our sales up. What are you doing anyway? And uh, the sales manager looks at him kind of perplexed. He said, well, sir, I, I, I told you last week we've got four big deals working, and any, if any one of them goes through, we're going to be way above the goal that you set for us. He said, well, I don't want promises. I want, I want business to happen, and it better happen soon, or I can replace you and get somebody to do your job. He said, now go outside and get to work. And so the sales manager stomps out the door. Now he's mad. He goes out, and uh, he looks at his uh, office assistant, and he said, here, he said, what about these files you were supposed to file yesterday I gave you? He said, why are these not taken care of yet? She said, well, I'm, I'm working on them right now, sir. He said, I, I want it done, and I want it done in a hurry. And he said, if you can't do it, I'll replace you and get somebody who can. So she gets up out of her chair, and she grabs the files and stomps over to the receptionist's desk, and she throws them down on the receptionist's desk, and she said, here, file these files away. You don't do anything but sit here and polish your nails all day anyway. And so then the, the receptionist is mad. And so the receptionist, when they yell at each other all day long there, and finally the receptionist, it's quitting time, she gets in her car and she drives home and she's getting out of the car and she sees her little boy Jimmy out there playing on the front steps and his pants are dirty and she walks up and she said, what have you been doing, young man? You've got dirt all over them britches. Don't you know I have to work all day to buy those pants for you and you don't care a thing about it? She said, you get, you get yourself in the house and you go upstairs and get in your room right now. He's now he's mad. He walks up the stairs, and there's a poor old cat sitting there on the edge of the porch. And he just hauls off and just kicks that cat like a football clear across the yard. He said, you dirty rascal, you've probably been up to something no good yourself. <laughs> now, here's the question. Wouldn't it have been better and saved a lot of people a lot of problem if Mr. B, the executive, the owner of the company, if he had just walked over there and kicked the cat himself and saved all those other people some trouble? <laughs> now, here's a better question. Whose cat are you kicking? It seems like a lot of people are living their life, especially Christians shouldn't be living their life where they have to go around kicking somebody's cat. We ought to be able to live life with joy, knowing that we're saved and we have something to rejoice about. I want to give you three things out of the passage today, out of Psalm 16, that might just might help you to be able to get along with somebody's cat. Number one, notice what David, who was running from his enemy and living a life of fear, he says in, uh, in the first few verses, he gives us, first of all, the practice of the godly man. The practice, in the first four verses, the practice of the godly man. He's living in the Lord's presence. Living in the Lord's presence. Watch this. He says, Preserve me, O God, for in thee do I put my trust. Are you putting your trust in the Lord? In verse 2, he says, O my soul, 
Thou hast said unto the Lord, Thou art my Lord. My goodness extendeth not to thee. He's saying, Lord, you're, you're my portion. You're the one I have. You're the one I depend on. And my goodness is not anything compared to yours. And, uh, and when we look up to God as the big one and we're the little one, we can understand how he can take care of us. He's living in the presence of the Lord. In verse 3 he says, But to the saints that are in the earth, to the excellent in whom is all my delight. He's living in the presence of the Lord. Can I just tell you that first of all, if you're going to have joy in life as a saved person, you must live in the presence of the Lord. I'm talking about when you wake up in the morning before your head comes off the pillow, it, wouldn't it be good if we just said, Thank you, Lord, I'm able to wake up this morning. Huh? You say, what's so great about that? Let him take away his oxygen from you and let him take away his water and food from you. Let him take away your heartbeat and you wouldn't wake up. Living in the presence of the Lord. I'm talking about waking up in the morning. If you're going to have a joyful life, wake up in the morning and say, Lord, I'm just glad you let me wake up today. I might not be awake this afternoon. I may be dead before sundown, but I'm awake right now. And I'm alive right now. Don't we all have the same amount of time? It's called the present, P-R-E-S-E-N-T. We don't have tomorrow. We've got today, the present. And I'll tell you, I'm afraid a lot of people are burning up the present in hopes of the future. It's going to be better tomorrow. You know, my ship will come in tomorrow. I'll win the lottery tomorrow. I'll find that perfect spouse tomorrow. I'll have the better job tomorrow. You know what we need to do? We need to learn to live in the present. <laughs> and live in the present means living in the presence of the Lord and just letting Him have control of your thoughts. Isaiah chapter 26, verse 3. Thou wilt keep Him in perfect peace. Thou wilt keep Him in perfect peace. O oh Lord, whose mind is stayed on thee. Stayed? What does that mean? That means it's fixed. So as we're living our, our moment, we need to be glancing up every few minutes, glancing up, acknowledging that the Lord is there. And whatever's happening to me in the present is because the Lord of the present is allowing it to happen. Hello? <laughs> Too many of us think, I don't deserve this. I don't deserve what these bad things that are coming my way. Live in the presence of the Lord and understand that He is the one that sends the present. <laughs> and if we don't enjoy the present, we may not even have a tomorrow. Life is short. It's very short. And if we don't learn to live for today and love today, and love this moment. You know, sometimes we come to church and we're not even living in the presence of the Lord the moment we're at church. We're thinking about the roast, the roast beast. <laughs> we're thinking about what we're going to do this afternoon. What, what would be... You know what, I told my wife, I don't know, two or three nights ago, I fixed up a delicacy to eat for an after-supper snack. It is a golden food called cornbread. Cornbread milk. Crumble it up in a glass. You say, are you a hillbilly? Absolutely. <laughs> There's some things that don't ever get, you just don't come up with anything better than cornbread and milk. I mean, it's like fried chicken. You, you hit the top when you get there. I was sitting there eating that glass of cornbread and milk and I got down to the bottom and I was scraping out the last few crumbs and I told my wife I had a, I had a great aha moment I said you know the terrible thing about eating cornbread and milk and she said what I said it's just gone way too quick <laughs> I wanted another one we need to learn to look at the present that way that it's so good we don't want it to end. Instead of hoping and living in tomorrow when things are going to be better, let's just enjoy what God gave us right now. Hello? <laughs> living in the Lord's presence. Number two, living for the Lord's people. Look at verse number three. But to the saints. Who's the saints? That means the, the fellow believers. 
but to the saints that are in the earth and to the excellent in whom is all my delight. He's talking about living with the Lord's people. David had a band of men that traveled with him. And they were, they were kind of a bunch of misfits. <laughs> in, one, in one passage of Scripture, it talks about the people that came to the Lord, or came to David, and it says uh, <clears throat> that there, there were those who were in debt, and those who were distressed, and those who were in trouble. I thought, that's a prophetic picture of Liberty Baptist Church. <laughs> But we're God's people. And if money made us happier, why do all those people in Hollywood kill themselves? I think, I think I'm right about this. Well, let me say, the Bible is right about this. That when you make God's people your closest friends, you're more likely to have joy in your life than you will if you hang out with the crowd that rejects God? Sure, I understand we're supposed to witness to the lost. But they have doorbells. We can ring their doorbell. We don't have to follow them to the nightclub. We don't have to go with them to drink and do drugs and do, do all of their dirty mischief. There is joy when we learn to love God's people. Now, all of God's people are not very lovable, though, are they? Can I just tell you that there's a lot of people, listen to me, there's a lot of people who drop out of church and drop out of having fellowship with God's people because somebody disappointed them. Where's your faith? Is it in, is it in people or is it in the Lord? If our faith is in God, then we can get along with God's people. And so we have to learn to enjoy God's people. And there's joy. Some people can't enjoy being at church because they'd rather be out partying or doing something else. But there's joy in the midst of God's people. You say, well, it just doesn't seem like as much fun. Learn to change. <laughs> you can't live with the dogs without getting fleas. Ask the prodigal son. When he went down to hang out with his worldly friends and and they were his friends as long as the money was there, but when he got broke and all the booze and all the harlots left him, he was left alone and in the hog pen. Ask him how those kind of friends work out. Church is important. Let me tell you something. Summertime is coming on. Summertime is coming on. Parents are not wise to take their kids and put them in Little League if Little League is going to take them out of church on Wednesday night and Sunday night. When we teach them that, that sports or any other activity is more than God's house and being with the Lord's people, we're telling them our priorities are way down here instead of way up here. And when they get grown, they'll live like that, ladies and gentlemen. And uh, there are things that are important in life, and I don't care how great Little League and how great Boy Scouts and how great uh, the theater and, uh, and how great anything else, any other activity, if they start pulling you out of the Lord's house, they are not your friend. You say, I just don't believe that. Okay, go ahead and try it. I, and if you want me to, I can give you some testimonies of people who have tried it and, and save you some time. The Lord's people living. David said uh, he liked to be with the saints. Verse 3 says, But to the saints that are in the earth and to the excellent in whom is all my what? Delight. He delighted in being with the people of God, do you? I, uh, I heard about the story about the preacher who decided one Sunday, he got up on a Sunday about like this. Boy, it's so warm when I walked outside this morning, I couldn't believe it. It was so warm. I think it broke a record last night, didn't it, for the, for the highest low ever? That's what they were saying on the 10 o'clock news last night. If the temperatures didn't go any lower than they thought it was going to go last night, it would be the highest low temperature for this date ever. And it was really warm when I went outside this morning. And, you know, I was thinking about just going fishing instead of coming here. <laughs> I didn't really. But, you know, I heard about the story about the preacher who decided he got up on a morning like this, and he said, this is just too nice. I can't let this pass. And uh, so he called his associate pastor. He said, hey, I've got an emergency that's come up. He said, I need you to preach for me this morning. And so he 
associate pastor said, okay, I'll do that, pastor. Hope everything turns out okay. He said, well, I believe it will. And so he got in his car and took his golf clubs and headed to the town about 20 miles away where nobody would see him and went to the golf course. And he's playing along by himself and everything's just going great. Man, nobody has recognized him and he's just having a blast while the rest of the folks are at home having church. And so, man, he gets to the last hole and he... Uh, it's, it's a long, long drive, but he hits that golf ball, and, man, it lofts just perfectly. It goes up and arches over, comes down on the green, bounces two or three times and rolls right into the cup, hole in one. Angel's talking to God up in heaven. He said, Lord, do you see that preacher down there? you see that sorry preacher? He's playing golf instead of going to church and preaching like he's supposed to. God said, I saw it. He said, well, what are you going to do about it? The Lord said, don't worry, I'll take care of it. The angel said, well, what are you going to do? He's, he's expecting fire to fall from heaven and just devour the preacher, at least burn up his golf clubs or golf cart or something. And just as that ball drops in the cup, angel looks at the Lord like, ain't you going to do something? The Lord didn't do anything. Finally, the angel said, I don't get it. You let him make a hole in one. You just going to let him get by with it? The Lord said, no, that's his punishment. He said, how can that be his punishment? He said, who's he going to tell? <laughs> going to the Lord's house is important. Being with the Lord's people on Sunday is important. And then he's also living by the Lord's precepts. Look at verse 4 again. Their sorrows shall be multiplied that hasten after another God. Their drink offerings... A blood will I not offer nor take up their names into my lips. You know what he's doing? He's saying, I'm going to live, I'm going to live according to the precepts of God. I could go along with the crowd, but I'm not going to. I'm not going to offer their blood and I'm not going to worship their gods. I'm going to live by the commandments of the Lord instead. Now, let me ask you a question. We're talking about living by the precepts. What are precepts? Well, that, that means the commands of God, what God's told us we ought to do. If we live according to the book, we'll be happier. Why? Because when we don't live by the book, we're often eaten up with guilt, and the Holy Spirit of God is going to convict us. You can't be happy... Listen carefully. You can't be happy while you're living in disobedience to God because the Holy Spirit is going to be convicting you and your conscience is going to be chewing on you all the time. And you might try to live it up and you might force a smile on your face, but you're not going to be happy on the inside living in rebellion to God. And so the psalmist has figured out living for God brings joy. Adrian Rogers used to say, Living for Jesus pays it pays in every way. Living for Jesus pays. It pays every day. And that's the way we ought to live. Number, big number two, the portion of the godly man. We're talking about now what? We're talking about satisfaction without perfection. David was not perfect. You're not perfect, and I'm not perfect. And our circumstances are not going to be perfect. So where does, where does our joy come in? Well, Look at verse number 5. It comes, first of all, in the Lord. Chapter, or chapter 16, verse 5. The Lord is the portion of mine inheritance and of mine cup. Thou maintainest my lot. What does it mean to maintain? It means the Lord's keeping your joy. The Lord's the one keeping your joy. So the portion of the godly man. When we're saved, look here. When we're saved, we can say, I may not have money. I may not have the nicest car, the nicest house. I may not be in the elite crowd. I may not be in that bunch who goes to the country club, but I've got the Lord, and that's what counts. He said, the Lord is mine. And then look at the second thing in verse number 6. He's also, he's, he's, his portion is in the Lord, and his portion is in the land. Verse 6, the, the lines are fallen unto me in pleasant places. Yea, I have a goodly heritage. What's he talking about? The lines are fallen unto me. What is that talking about? When Joshua brought the children of Israel into the promised land, remember the land that floweth with milk and honey. 
when Joshua brought them into the promised land, he divided up the land among the children of Israel according to lots. And David says, the part that fell to me in the promised land is very pleasant. You say, well, yeah, but I don't live in Israel. I'm not a Jew. I don't have any heritage of ground or land or a plot. I don't even have any acreage. So what have we got? Israel and living in the promised land is a picture of the spirit-filled Christian life. Are you with me? We might not have ground with dirt, but we've got a land of promise that God has given us. When we get saved, we have a land that's given to us. It's the land that flows with milk and honey. It's the land that causes us to have joy. And uh, the, the consecrated life, look here, the consecrated life, the spirit-filled life is when we've surrendered to him and we have made him our portion, then he gives us that land which is the, the circumstances in which we live. And the circumstances in which we live can be joyful no matter what they look like to the unspiritual person. Are you listening? That means that when, when the bank account's empty, you can still have joy. It means that when the children are sick, you can still have joy. It means that when, uh, when the job has ended and you don't know where you're going to work next, it means you can still have pleasant peace in your heart. That's the promised land for the Christian. Living in the land of promise means that we're sold out, spirit-filled, and we're going to live for Him no matter what. And you can wake up having joy in the morning. You don't have to have stuff. You know why so many people are miserable in this life? is because they believe they have to have stuff and money to be happy. Or perfect circumstances in your family. It ain't going to happen, friend. <laughs> Not in this life. And then the portion of the godly man is not only in the Lord and in the land, but uh, I want to take you to number three, my final point, the prospects of the godly man. The prospects of the godly man in this life, somebody says, you know, I know it'll be all right in the sweet by and by, but what about the nasty now and now? Well, number one, the psalmist had joy and he learned to be content. Are you listening to me? I'm telling you how to have contentment this morning. I'm telling you how to have joy regardless of what else you may or may not have. Satisfaction without perfection. In this life, the psalmist knew he was guided by God. Look at verse number 7. I will bless the Lord who hath given me what? Counsel. What's that? That's guidance. My reins also instruct me in the night season. What's reins? Ever ride a horse? <laughs> you pull on this side, and he goes this way. Pull on this side, and he goes that way. Well, there's different ways of reining animals, I know, but uh, that's basically the way it works. The reins are used to steer the animal, and in life, when we, when we surrender to God, now listen, I'm saying when, when we're surrendered to God, and that means living that way every day, waking up, saying, Lord, whatever today brings, no matter how it looks, I'm going to recognize that you brought the circumstances and I'm going to let you be in charge of my reins. You're going to guide me. And if it looks like I'm going to face the wild beasts today, <laughs> then, Lord, I put my reins in your hands and let you guide me. Your counsel is where I'll go and I'll be fine. Guided by God. Being guided by God is more than just saying a simple testimony and saying, well, you know, I love the Lord and I'm just going to follow God. Well, saying that's one thing, but doing it when times are tough is different, isn't it? It's not how you respond on the mountaintop, it's how you respond in the valley that shows whether you're surrendered to God or not and whether He's guiding you. I mean, shucks, anybody can shout on the mountaintop. But when you're walking through the valley of the shadow of death, that's when you really need some guidance. And some people wait until they're in the valley, until they look for guidance. 
Can I just tell you that by being... Some of you might be sitting here this morning thinking, you know, I haven't really got anything going on in my life right now. The preacher's wasting his message on me. And, uh, you know, everything's fine. It's hunky-dory. Got nothing going on. I could have stayed home today and slept in, and the preacher could have saved his breath. The day will be very soon when you will be in the valley. You're either in the valley right now, or you're just coming out of a valley, or you're about to go into a valley. And if you wait until you're in the valley to seek God's counsel and God's guidance, you're going to find yourself frustrated and unhappy a lot of the time. The psalmist said, I'm guided by God. You know what? He'd made up his mind ahead of time. I'm going to let God guide me today, even though everything's going great. I'm going to let God guide me. And then when I find myself in the valley tomorrow or next week or next year, I'll have the counsel. That's why we come to church, we hear the preaching, we read the Bible, we pray and we surrender to God every day as we go along. And then when we find ourselves in the valley, we'll have the answer right then. Are you listening? We'll have the answer about which way to turn then instead of having to sit down and weep and cry and beg and say, God, I don't know what to do. You need it ahead of time. I posted I post a devotion on the internet. Uh, I've got a blog uh, that's attached to our church uh, web page, and I've got a, it's a personal blog where I do devotions. I do one on Facebook and different places, and uh, and I I posted a, a very short devotion about about not being gullible, having wisdom, to not make hasty decisions and find yourself in a bad situation. A woman contacted me and she said, "I wish I'd have read this yesterday." I wish I'd have read this yesterday. You know what I'm thinking? I'm thinking like a pastor. <laughs> I'm thinking, if you'd read it yesterday, and the day before, and the day before, and the week before, if you'd read the others too, you wouldn't find yourself in this situation. We wait until we're in pain to respond. And then you're not thinking clear. Are you listening? <laughs> we're not thinking clear. Once we're in pain, then we're looking for a way out. You know, you're like, you're like the rat that's caught in a trap. And man, you're trying to jerk yourself loose. And you don't know which way you're going. You need wisdom ahead of time from God, guidance from God, so you don't try to nibble on the cheese that's in the trap. Hello? <laughs> People drop into church maybe once a month or every six months and, and, uh, and they think that one little meal is going to sustain them for the next six months. It ain't going to work. <laughs> I don't know about you, but I need reminded every day, every single day I need to be reminded of the promises of God and get the guidance of God so I can stay out of the rat trap every day instead of waiting until my foot's caught in it and then I've got to go try to find out what to do. And the reason a lot of people are not happy and they're, they're not satisfied in life is because they're not guided by God. Must be guided by God. And number two, they're guarded by God. David said he was guarded by God. In verse number eight, I have, all, I have set the Lord always before me because he is at my right hand. I shall not be moved. He had God as his guard. When you take care of the Lord's business, he'll take care of yours. And then he's gladdened by God in verse number nine. Therefore, my heart is what? Glad. Therefore my heart is glad and my glory rejoiceth. Isn't that what we're talking about, dear friend? Listen, we're talking about being glad and having satisfaction without perfection, without having to have everything around us perfect. Remember, David was on the run, and he said, I'm glad. The dogs are on his trail, but he says, I'm glad. God's allowed this to happen. So in this life, he was glad because he knew he had God's guidance and he had God's guarding and he had God's gladness in this life. But what about in that life, the next life? Look at verses 10 and 11. Thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. Uh, there's truth there of the resurrection. There's a great truth of the resurrection. God will resurrect those who belong to Him. One of these days you won't have that, that body that causes you pain. You know that body that's got those problems that the doctor can't seem to solve? That body that can't see well? That body that can't walk well? 
But one of these days there will be a resurrection and all that's going to be solved. And so our affliction is temporary as a Christian. And not only the truth of the resurrection, but in verse 11 you have truth of rapture. I'm not talking about the rapture. I'm talking about rapture as in the word delight, joy, and bliss. Verse 11 says, Thou wilt show me the path of life. In thy presence is fullness of joy. At thy right hand there are pleasures forevermore. There is a day coming when we will sit in the presence of God and we will look at Him face to face. And then we'll say, it was worth it all. Now some of you, listen, I'm concluding, some of you might be spending more, more of your time complaining than you are rejoicing. And I'm not complaining at you now. I'm just trying to help you to see that you don't have to spend your life complaining just because of circumstances. Spending our time complaining, you may be spending your time complaining because you might say, well, preacher, you just don't know what, what I've been through. Preacher, you don't know what my life has been like. You don't know my circumstances. You don't know what I feel. You don't know what I've gone through. Well, that may be true. But I know what David went through. I know David was having dodged the spears and arrows. His own men often, once even offered to stone him to death. I know what he went through. I know what the Apostle Paul went through. He said he went through afflictions and fears and trembling inside and out, day and night, in a shipwreck three times and, and stoned and left for dead. And all of these things happened to the Apostle Paul. And yet Paul said, I have learned in whatsoever state I'm in therewith to be content. That's tough. He learned to be content. And nobody would say Paul's life was without bad circumstances. I know what our Lord went through. I know what Jesus went through to purchase our redemption. I know that he was spit upon, he was mocked, he was humbled, he was stripped, he was beaten, he, was, uh, he bore a crown of thorns in our place and had his hands and, uh, hands and feet pierced for us so his blood would be shed to pay for our sins so we could be saved. I know what he went through. Have you gone through more than Jesus, more than Paul? More than Job? More than David? A lady told me that she had lost her desire to go to church anymore. She said, because of the way people have treated me. She said, people have treated me badly, and so I just lost my, lost my desire to go to church. My question is, has the Lord failed you? I think not. And if our faith is in people, we'll always be disappointed. But if our faith is in Him and we live in His presence, we can be happy. And none of us are going to be perfect. And He can give you joy. Let's pray together. Father, I pray that you'd bless.